I just wanted to go ahead and introduce our speaker this evening because we love to flow right from worship to our, to our message. And I want to just say just a, a brief word about Catherine Martin. She is an awesome Bible teacher. I, we spent lunch today, and um, this is a woman who knows God's Word and loves God's Word. I mean, she has all the computer gizmo gadgets, logo software, so she can read in the Greek and the Hebrew and dig deep, and it's her passion to take that knowledge and to inspire women to know their Savior, to really get their roots solid in Him, and I so love that. That is what virtue ministry is all about. I mean, all this other stuff, this is window dressing, and it's, it's fun, and it'll change probably in 10 years, and we'll laugh at ourselves and the things we did today. But one thing is never going to change, and that is the Word of God. And I love Catherine for that. She is awesome. You're going to love her. Her message tonight um, really speaks to myself and, and my daughter-in-law and our family as we remember the anniversary of our son going to heaven tomorrow. And um, it's all about standing strong when the winds blow hard, and they do blow hard. But anyway... You will welcome them, right? Rousingly welcome her, I should say. When Tim says, welcome Catherine Martin, you guys will let her feel like we really love her because we do, okay? And so the band's going to start with worship now, and I will focus on the things that are the most important tonight. There's nothing I love more than sitting down with my Bible and a cup of coffee with my sisters in the Lord and sharing what God is teaching us. And as I prayed today, about today, I thought what I want to do is share what God's been teaching me over the last three years. And I can tell you that if I could sum it up in one word, it would be the word faith. And faith, of course, is a huge topic. I mean, I just finished writing a book on faith, and the temptation is want to cover everything that's in that book because it, faith is so important to our walk. But what I want to focus on is faith in the trial of your life. How to stand strong when the winds blow hard. Sometimes the winds just blow hard, don't they? I mean, I remember being in the desert, and when it rains in the desert, it can really rain, and it can really blow hard, and I remember I was sitting outside a store, and in my car, and I was getting ready to go in, and it was just pouring rain, and so I had my trusty umbrella, and you know those kind of umbrellas that have the button that you push it, and it goes, woof, and it opens, well, I open the car door, the car door flies open, almost flies off my car, and I put the umbrella outside and pushed the button. It flew open, it went inside out, and it blew away. <laughs> my umbrella, what good was that? I remember another day when I was in Phoenix, and I had my mother, who is in a wheelchair, and we were in a building, and we came outside to get back in the car, and it was pouring rain. It's one of those situations where you go, really, really? Does it have to be pouring rain? And I said to my mother, I said, Mother, we are going to get wet. And she, being who she is, and someday I would love for you to meet my precious mother. She's one of my heroes of the faith. She says, let's go for it. And I go, okay, let's go for it. So we get, I have the wheelchair, and I'm rushing her through water, pouring rain. We get to the car. I get her in the front seat. I go around. I open the trunk. I put the wheelchair in the trunk, close the trunk, get in the car. And I look at the two of us, and we are like sopping wet. And on my mother's face is the biggest smile you have ever seen. And she says, wasn't that fun? <laughs> oh, the power of a wind-blown storm. And I can tell you, for me, the last three years have been quite a storm. And I would venture to say that for you, it has probably been a storm, too, at times. It seems like everyone I talk to 
is either going through or has gone through a storm in their life, the trial that's impossible. So what I want to talk about is how to stand strong when those winds blow hard. And I can tell you that I am so excited to share from the word this message because I believe that God is calling us to a renewal, a revival, a renaissance of faith. My dear Beverly that I am staying at her house and she has been in my life for more than 17 years, my great encourager, she's with me today down here. She asked me last night, Catherine, what do you want everyone to go away with? And I thought, good question. And I said, I want us all to leave excited, on fire, to walk by faith, not by sight. That's my prayer. And may it be so. How to stand strong when the winds blow hard. Back in 2008, Hurricane Ike began as a tropical storm off the coast of Africa. And within days, it reached a Category 4 hurricane, 145 miles per hour. And by the time it hit the coast of Texas, it was going 100 miles per hour. And it reached its maximum there on the Bolivar Peninsula at Gilcrest, Texas. It destroyed 200 homes in Gilchrist, Texas. As a matter of fact, it destroyed every home except for one. And once the winds stopped, the sight was so strange, so amazing, a photo of an entire coast of homes down on the ground except for one lone house standing that pictures of it flooded the internet. It went viral. So I wanted to show you the picture, and I have it on the screen for you. Look at that. Their home had been demolished three years earlier by Hurricane Rita, and it gives us the secret to why that lone house was standing. And it is because it had been destroyed three years earlier by Hurricane Rita. And the owners decided that they were going to rebuild that house to specification according to be able to withstand a Category 5 hurricane. And so they paid attention to every single detail. And their attention to detail made the difference, didn't it? Because the winds blew, hurricane force winds, and every single house was flattened and devastated except for their house. And friends, I am just going to tell you today, I want to be that yellow house. When a Category 5 trial comes my way, I want to be the one that is standing strong when the winds blow hard. And my passion is for us, church, to be the ones that will stand strong when the winds blow hard. So how is it that we can stand strong? We're going to look at it today. And what we're going to do is go out on the Sea of Galilee with Jesus, and we are going to have a lesson on faith. So get ready because we're going to go out in a boat. Turn to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. And the event that we're going to talk about starts at verse 22, just so that you can get ready. But I want to give you a little background. Because the disciples and Jesus had an amazing day of ministry. Another great teaching lesson where Jesus was teaching, he was healing. There were 5,000 men And there were more women and children in the thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And the disciples said to Jesus, you know, we need to send them away so that they can eat. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And that led to the great miracle. 
by Jesus of the feeding, what's been known as the feeding of the 5,000, where he took five loaves of bread and two fish and fed all of those thousands of people and had 12 basketfuls of food left over. What an amazing day. And so that night, who knows how the disciples felt, probably excited, maybe a little tired. What a day of ministry that was. And it says in the scripture that Jesus was compelled, made them get in the boat to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And he sent the crowds away and went up to the mountain to pray. And so this motley crew of men were in a boat in a long distance from land, miles and miles from land. And it says in Matthew 14, 24, if you'll look at it with me, that the wind was contrary at the end. The wind was contrary. Would you look at each other and say, the wind was contrary? (laughs) Now, I have you do that because there are contrary winds in life, aren't there? That was a shock to me. When I first came to know the Lord, and I was in college, and I gave my life to the Lord. My roommates were shocked. I was the last person you would have ever thought would give their life to Jesus. And I'll never forget, I came out of the room and I said, I've just given my life to Jesus. And my roommate, I thought she was going to pass out. And so I thought, you know, I'll never have another problem again. And so what a shock it was when a trial came my way. But Jesus did say in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. So the wind was contrary. And in some of your margins of Bibles, it will say adverse. And what it means is that it was hostile. It was opposing. It's the impossibles in your life. Where if God does not intervene, how are you going to make it? So there they are on the Sea of Galilee, a big piece of water, 15 miles long, 8 miles wide, and they were miles and miles away from shore, and the boat was up and down because of the wind. And now, according to the account, in Matthew 14, 25, it is the fourth watch of the night, sometime between 3 and 6 in the morning. And I want to just read this with you. It says, starting at verse 25, in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. You are certainly God's son. Now, who says the Bible isn't exciting? So rich. And as we read this passage, one thing is clear. This passage is all about faith. And it's all about faith in the storm because Jesus says, You of little faith, why did you doubt So what does Jesus want us to know about faith in the storm when the wind blows hard? Well, I believe that he wants us to have a walk-on-water faith, the kind of faith that defies the adverse, contrary winds of circumstances and feelings of fear, discouragement, and despair. It's the kind of faith where you say, wow, I am walking on water with Jesus above and through every circumstance. And because I'm walking with him, I am seeing him do something amazing. 
something incredible, something only he can do. Now keep in mind, Jesus wants to take them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee in spite of the wind, in spite of the storm. And we need to understand that God has a plan for our life. God has a plan for your life. And he intends to accomplish that plan in spite of the wind, in spite of the storm, in and through it. When dreams are shattered, God is broadening your vision, not only of himself, but of what he intends to do in and through you. And when he says no to one thing, it's because he is wanting to say yes to something else. Something awesome. And you will see it, if not now, one day, to be amazing and incredible. And that's walk on water faith. We need a renewal, a revival of faith. The Lord Jesus wants to move you and me from fear to faith. So it's the fourth watch of the night. And you know how it is at that time, sometime between 3 and 6 in the morning. It's the most difficult time of your day sometimes. We're overcome thinking about the things that we're facing perhaps. And in the fourth watch, it's so much easier to come to the certainty and conclusion that you will not make it. So there they are in the boat in the dark, between three and six in the morning, Jesus came to those men. And here's the first thing about faith in the fourth watch. When the wind is blowing hard, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Jesus, not look at, not look for, look to Jesus. He came to those disciples, and you need to know you're not alone. He is with you in the storm. Faith begins with seeing Jesus and depending on him for everything in your life. In Hebrews 12, 2, following the description, a whole chapter about the heroes of the faith, we learn that we are in a race, and God tells us how to run our race, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I call it E-O-J, eyes on Jesus. And sometimes when I see my friends, I say, E-O-J, eyes on Jesus, because it's a reminder that we want to, first of all, look to Jesus Look to him in the storm. And this is such a huge secret in the trial of your life when the winds are blowing hard because we are so tempted to literally live in the trial and believe all the discouragement, the despair, the obstacle of it, and literally forget the Lord. And so look to Jesus. He is the answer. He holds all the solutions. He is not surprised. It is not as though he is going, oh, no, look what happened. I need to work this out. I need to figure, I mean, I, you know, no. He holds everything in his hand, and he will lead and guide you. A.W. Tozer says, faith is the gaze of a soul upon a saving God. I love that. I love that. What we need to understand here is in the trial of our life, when the wind is blowing hard, we need to learn to look not only with physical eyes, but with spiritual eyes. Paul prayed in Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Enlightened. It's the eyes of our heart looking to Jesus. Faith in the trial begins with seeing Jesus. So I want to ask you, since we are in what we're calling Girl Talk Bible Study, I love that. We're studying the Bible together. I mean, how exciting is that? I mean, it's one of my favorite things to do. So in this, I want to ask, where in your life right now do you need to look to Jesus? The disciples were out there, and they're afraid. The wind is blowing. Jesus comes walking on the water, and they say, it is a ghost. How many times have you felt like, it is a ghost? Well, that was them. And in that, 
Jesus speaks and he says this, be of courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. You can see it right there in scripture. And I want you to underline those words. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Because if you want to have faith in the fourth watch of the night, not only do you need to look to Jesus, you need to listen to Jesus. Jesus is speaking to you. And where does he speak? In his word. He speaks in his word. And we've got to have God's word in the storm. We must have it. God's word is the secret to standing strong. Now keep your finger in Matthew 15. Turn back to Matthew 7. Starting at verse 24. This is Jesus speaking, and it's the, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And listen to what he says, and this speaks exactly to what we're talking about here. Therefore, everyone, Matthew 7, 24, who hears these words of mine and acts on them, may be compared to a wise man or woman who built his house on the rock, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. It's the great secret to standing strong when the winds blow hard. The word of God, God gives us his word. And he will use it in our lives to enable us to stand strong. We have got to become masters of the word of God. We want to know it better than we know any other thing. And I can tell you that when I got my first Bible, I did not know where the books of the Bible were. As a matter of fact, I took back my first Bible to the Christian bookstore because I thought it was missing one of the books of the Bible because I could not find the book Hezekiah. And I was looking all the way through the Bible for Hezekiah and I went back to the woman and I said, hey, you know, I need another Bible because it doesn't have Hezekiah. And she goes, honey, there is no Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a king. He's not a book of the Bible. And I go, oh, okay. So that was the beginning of my journey in the word of God. But we want to know what Jesus says in his word because he gives it to us with great purpose. It is filled with promises from Genesis to Revelation. It's what I call the I am's and the I will's of the Bible. It's where God is saying, this is who I am. It's where he's saying, I will do this. I will do that. And I underline it all over the place and star it and everything else. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, Colossians 3.16. So how are you doing these days? Another application question to listening to Jesus. Is it your habit to be in the word of God? We need the promises. Such great promises when we're in the heat of a trial. Like God saying, I have a plan for you. I will accomplish what concerns you. I will provide for you. Now in this case, the Lord Jesus gave quite the amazing promise to those men who were in the boat, freaked out. Because here he is walking, taking an enjoyable stroll on top of the waves of the water. And he says, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Do you know what those words are? It is I. Do you know what he was promising them when he said that? Because in the Greek... The words for it is I is ego eimi. And what those words are, are the Greek words, if you go back to the Old Testament and you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, they're the words for I am. When Moses said to God, what is your name? What shall I tell them? God said, I am. Am. Yahweh. That's the word, the name, Yahweh. And what he's saying when he says this is, I am everything you need for every circumstance of life. 
And so all the way through the New Testament, there are the ego a me statements of Jesus where he is making an absolute claim to deity that he is God, that he is Yahweh. When he says, I am the light of the world, the word that's used is ego a me. When he says, I am the bread of life, ego a me. And one of the greatest places where he says that is when he was having a standoff between the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were challenging his identity and who he was. And they said, how can you talk about Abraham? How can you possibly even know who Abraham is? And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And those words are ego, amy. He was saying, I am Yahweh. And so if you can picture this scene where the disciples are in the boat and strolling along the water on top of the waves is Yahweh himself, Emmanuel, God with us. And he sees his disciples absolutely freaked out, what I call fine, freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> and he says, take courage. It is I. I am Yahweh. Do not be afraid. Now, That leads us to this, the third thing. To have faith in the fourth watch of the night when the wind is blowing hard. Respond to Jesus. You need to get out of the boat. Because whenever Jesus teaches something, says something, reveals something about himself, about who he is, what he does, he expects a response. If you read through all the Gospels, you'll notice that whenever he taught, whenever he was doing something, he always looked for a response. And we need to have a new perspective about the trials of our life. You see, as far as Jesus is concerned, the trial is not your undoing. The trial is your opportunity for faith. Now, I don't know if you can wrap your mind around that. <laughs> but in light of what I've been through in the last three years, I've had to wrap my mind around it. Because it's the thing that the Lord has brought me to. And it's uncomfortable at times. Because it's a little scary thing to get out there and walk on the water. But it's your opportunity for faith to see a mighty display of God's power and glory. So get out of the boat. Respond to Jesus. Launch out in faith and take God at his word. Jesus came to those disciples. He spoke to them. And we know for a fact he wanted to move them from fear to faith. Three times it says they were afraid and terrified. And actually, if you study it in the Greek, it means panicked. Have you ever been in a state of panic? About, I mean, sometimes I have the gift of panic. <laughs> I know that place very well. And so there are the 12 disciples in the boat shaking. And I wonder how many of you right now and I wouldn't have you raise your hands. But I wonder how many of you are living in constant fear. In the trial of your life, you're shaking. The Lord wants to move you from fear to faith. So what are you going to do with his word? Because the majority stayed in the boat in fear, in freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. But in the midst of that, with the promise, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid, there was one 
who reasoned it through, thought about what he said, and an idea came to him. And instead of reacting in fear, he responded in faith, and he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out to you on the water. And what Peter was saying there gives us a great definition for faith, and here's what it is. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith is taking God at his word. Because you see, he took Jesus at his word and he said, command me to come out on the water. And what he was saying is, Lord, your word is enough. If you will just say it, I know I can come out on the water. That's enough for me. And the centurion said the same thing. You remember when the centurion said, Lord, if you just say the word that my servant will be healed because I understand the authority of your word, I know he'll be healed. And Jesus said, it says there, only one of two times in the entire uh, gospels, it says he was amazed. Don't you want Jesus to be amazed? At your faith, it says he was amazed. So the secret of faith, your word, is enough. Faith is fueled by God's word. We need the word of God because, you know, life is so much like a fog sometimes. And we are like that boat out in the fog of circumstances at times where the boat, in order to make it through the fog and not be crushed by the huge Commercial liners all around it has to fly by instruments only. Well, sometimes we need to fly by instruments only because it is as though sometimes the, winds, the windows are painted black. But our radar, the word of God. The word of God. He speaks and we respond. Faith is taking God at his word. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. I think Jesus loved it when Peter said that because I look at his response. Look at what he said. Verse 29, he said, come, come. It was a simple word, but a big word because out of that word, what he was saying is, I will enable you to walk on the water. I do want you to get out of the boat. I do want you to walk on the water and you are going to see a miracle All of that in one word. The promises of God, so powerful. We need to build up an arsenal of promises in God's word. And it says in verse 29 here that Peter got out of the boat. Would you underline that in your Bible if you are so inclined, which I do all the time? Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus, when we hear the word of the Lord, we have got to get out of the boat and act on the promise of God's word. We get out by faith in God's promises. Now, you may still feel afraid, but you're going to respond in faith. You're not going to react to the fear or the worry or whatever. Respond in faith, and that's always the choice for us. We can look at our worries or respond to the word of Jesus. Peter took the Lord at his word. He got out of the boat and with eyes fixed on Jesus, if you can just imagine, he gets out of the boat and probably it was up high like this and he walks and gets down on top of the water. And when he stood on that water, the waves weren't Moving around, he found solid ground as he walked. A miracle. Now, I can't help but think, you know, you could stay in the boat, but I can't help but think how amazing it was to get out of the boat. With your faith. I mean, you could choose to stay in the boat, and be afraid and just kind of sit there in the boat. I remember the first time I ever stood in front of a thousand women 
Well, I was getting ready to stand in front. I wasn't quite sure I would get up to stand in front of those thousand women because I was sitting at the table and I can tell you I was so afraid. I mean, I'm looking around, a thousand women, and I was supposed to give my testimony. And as I'm sitting there and everybody's eating, having a great time, and I'm sitting there just looking and I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? And then the thought came to me, you know, I could just get up and I could run out of this room. <laughs> and no one would ever know. And I mean, I'd be, go well, they would know. I, I mean, they probably wouldn't ask me to do it again, right? But I thought I could just get up and I could run out. And then the Spirit of God worked in my heart and said, but you know what else you could do? Yes, you are afraid. But what if you just get up there on the stage, as afraid as you are, and you could even freak out, but what if you just get up there and give your testimony anyway? And I said, you know what, Lord? That's what I'm going to do. And so I just walked up there. I marched up there. And as soon as I got up and I had my notes, and as soon as I started speaking, you know what? I forgot my fear. As I started sharing the message. And before I knew it, I was having fun. I was like moving around. And I finally got to give the gospel. And I saw a bunch of people come to know the Lord. And I said, Lord, that was the most fun I've ever had. But what if I hadn't gotten out of the boat? I would have just sat in the boat. Well, in this case, I would have been outside the building and in my car and on the way who knows where? I don't know. I remember another day when I was in the kitchen and I had just been studying Psalm 62 about worry, about, about trusting, actually, trusting in the Lord. And there was a verse that said, trust in the Lord at all times. And as I'm standing there in the kitchen, I was reviewing my list of worries. Do you have a list of worries? And I was reviewing my list of worries, and I was just like working in the kitchen, and I'm reviewing my list of worries, and all of a sudden, I stopped. And the thought came to me, and I really believe it was the Spirit of God at work, what if you just don't worry right now? What if you just trust? And then that verse from Psalm 62 came into my head. Trust in the Lord at all times. And I go, well, wait a minute. I mean, because this is a very serious thing I'm thinking about here. You know, I, I, I don't know about that because, you know, I really feel like I need to worry about it. And, you know, they've said that worry is like a rocking chair. It goes back and forth and never gets anywhere. And the Lord in that moment showed me to trust in him at all times and that what it means is that there is no time, no situation, no storm that is blowing so hard that you know what? You better stop trusting and you better start worrying. Or you better stop walking by faith and you better get afraid. There is no time. Trust in him at all times. That was a powerful promise that the Lord put to work in me. So Peter was doing well walking on water, and he was so walking so well that he came toward Jesus, and I have to think that maybe Jesus was smiling. It was quite the moment for him. He took Jesus at his word, and then something happened. Something came into the picture. The wind. And it tested his faith. To have faith in the fourth watch, when the wind blows hard, we've got to believe Jesus, not the wind. Believe Jesus. Because sometimes when we are moving from fear to faith and our faith is being tested, the wind sometimes blows harder, doesn't it? Before it blows less, before it dissipates. And what we need to do in that moment is look past the wind to the Lord and remember that nothing is too hard 
for him. It's not that you don't see the wind. It's not that you're denying the wind, but you look past it to the Lord. Abraham, in Romans 4, was able to consider the impossibilities. God had promised to give him a son, and he and his wife were well past 100 years old. And it says that he was able to consider the human impossibilities of that, but without wavering, he grew strong in faith with regard to the promise and believed that God was able to do what he promised to do. And here is where I believe we can truly understand what walk on water faith is because we have to say, am I going to believe all the worst case scenarios that go through my mind, of which most never happen, or am I going to believe that I won't make it? Or am I going to believe and calculate God as the big and only factor in my life. Walk on water faith is this, the ability to see beyond the temporal circumstances to the eternal realities of God and his promises. And as a result, take God at his word and act on his promises in spite of conflicting circumstances, thoughts, and feelings. Peter had a conflicting circumstance here, didn't he? Contrary wind. And I believe he forgot the promise. And he started thinking only about what the wind could do. And then he began to sink. The other choice would have been to look past the wind and fix his eyes on Jesus. And I know right now there are those in this room that are faced with some impossibles. And I say impossible because, frankly, you have no answer. But remember, God has a plan. And maybe there is no earthly answer. But never calculate without God. It's an impossible circumstance for us, for those around us, from an earthly perspective, but it is not for God. Nothing is impossible for God. The Word of God is what the Spirit of God uses in our life to grow our faith, to change us, to remind us of who God is, what God does, and what He says and to calculate God into the picture as the only factor that really counts. It's God. Calculate him. He does for you what you can never do for yourself. So in the case of Peter, he was walking on water, but he became consumed with the wind. He began to sink, and that leads to this. To have faith in the fourth watch when the wind blows hard, if you want to stand strong, Pray to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Peter cried out, and you see it in verse 30. Lord, save me. A huge cry of faith. And I love this. Look at what it says in verse 31. Immediately, underline that. Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him. I love that Jesus did for Peter what he couldn't do for himself. And that's what he does. That's what the Lord does. Faith is a gift from the Lord. It grows in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see in Galatians 2.20 that we are crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And what we see there is it's him in us. Christ is your life. He is everything you need. That's why when he says, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. You don't need to be afraid because of who he is. The best thing you can do is stop worrying, stop being afraid, 
and, and stop sinking and pray. Cry out to the Lord. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peter moved his attention from the word to the wind, and he began sinking. He cried out to the Lord in prayer. Jesus immediately took hold of him and said, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And what we see in those words is, for Jesus, the wind was no excuse to have a lapse in faith. The wind was no obstacle to what Jesus wanted to do. Let's remember that. Whatever wind is coming your way right now, think about that yellow house that stood, category five. And sometimes it is a category five trial. And it goes on to say that when they got back to the boat, the wind stopped. Now, how did they get back to the boat? Well, I think they walked together. And at the appointed time, the wind did, in fact, stop. Because the wind in the fourth watch of the night stops, even though we feel it will go on forever. God does something only he can do. He promises and that leads to this, finally, to have faith in the fourth watch of the night. Worship Jesus. Verse 33, look what it says. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. Look at the difference in the disciples from beginning to end. you are going to see a whole new, more glorious view of Jesus. As a matter of fact, when you are in the trial of your life, one of the questions to ask the Lord Jesus is, what is it that you want me to see about you? Because he intends to show you something about himself. He will do something amazing, something great. But look at the disciples. They were no longer afraid. They were worshiping Jesus they looked at him in a new way. He wasn't just a teacher or a rabbi. No, he was God's son. But here's the thing I see about this. Think about everything that had happened to them in the last two days. Do you know what? They didn't get the new view and the worship and moving from fear to faith when the sun was shining. And when there was a huge miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, no, where was it? Out in the fourth watch of the night, between three and six in the morning, when the wind was raging, that was when they saw that he is Yahweh. The ego eni, the one who is the answer for everything that you will ever face in life. They would never look to him as the same again. And you will never look at him the same again when you walk on water with your faith. Remember, if a dream is shattered, God will broaden your vision and you will go on to a whole new adventure with him. So when the wind blows hard, these are the things to remember. Look to Jesus. Listen to Jesus respond to Jesus, believe Jesus, pray to Jesus, and worship Jesus. So I called my father on December 24th, 2012, because I had remembered he was going to the doctor because he'd been feeling like he had the flu and he was coughing. And I was sitting in the church parking lot for our Christmas Eve service, and I decided that I'd give him a call, and I said, Dad, it's Kath. I want to know how you're doing. How did that doctor's appointment go today? And it was silent on the other end. He said, I don't want to tell you. Dad, what is it? Well, honey, he got choked up. He says, I have cancer. And I felt as though I'd been hit with a ton of bricks, and we cried, we prayed. 
My dad is one of my best friends. And that began a nine-month journey with my father through cancer. And somewhere in the middle of it, I became discouraged and in despair. And me, you know, an author, speaker, founder of Quiet Time Ministries, you know, lover of the Lord, lover of God's word. And so I sat with the Lord one morning looking to Jesus, and I read Romans 12, 2, that says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there's another translation that says, let God transform you by changing the way you think. That was a prayer of faith for me because I began praying, Lord, change me the way I think. Change me by changing the way I think. And what God led me to do in all of that was to ask him for promise every day in my quiet time. And so I began sitting in my quiet time alone with the Lord. And I would be in the word and I would say, Lord, what's my promise for today? And he would show it to me and I would write it out in my journal. And then I would take it with me because I would take my journal with me and then I would take my camera and I would take my Bible and I would go outside and I would shoot some of his amazing beauty. And then I would sit out there as the sun is rising and I would read through those promises and I would pray through those promises. And what the Lord began doing in me was changing me, transforming me by changing the way I think through praying through his promises and living in his promises. And I truly began to experience joy and peace in the midst of some very rough waters. And I can tell you that he even taught me to pray, believe, and worship in a new way in the midst of those waters. And on September 18th, my father went home to be with the Lord. But I have the comfort of knowing that he is face to face with the Lord. And I will see him someday soon. I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, someday you will hear that I have died. Don't believe a word of it. <laughs> because in that day, I will be more alive than ever before. Amen? Amen. Amen. I believe the Lord will call us into circumstances that are too much for us, and he wants us to step out onto the water with his promises. So I want to give you a few essentials to help you live in God's word and live in the promises, and I'm going to do this very quickly uh, because of time. Um, but I want to share just a few things that have helped me to live in the promises of God, and I believe they will help you to live in his promises as well. And the first is, every morning, I sit down in my quiet time with the Lord. And I have a time, a place, and a plan to be alone with the Lord in my quiet time. And my quiet time is the place where I begin to look to Jesus, to listen to Jesus in his word, to respond to Jesus, and I write things in my journal and to believe Jesus, and to pray to Jesus, and to worship Jesus. And so I organize all my materials in this quiet time basket. So your quiet time is the first essential. Another essential for me is a Bible reading plan. And I may be in a Bible study. As a matter of fact, last year we did Pilgrimage of the Heart with about 200 women, and it was the first study I ever wrote. But there are times when you're not in that Bible study. And so I encourage you to have other Bible reading plans as well. One of my favorite plans that I love is Encounter with God by Scripture Union. I love that. It gives you something to read and a devotion every day, and it's really in the Word of God. I have devotionals that I choose that I absolutely love. My favorite devotionals for every day Daily Light on the Daily Path, you probably know that. And it's got all kinds of scripture in it. And 
depending on what verse leaps off the page and grabs me by the throat and throws me to the ground, which is R.C. Sproul's definition of the illumination of the Holy Spirit, um, if it jumps off the page, I'll turn to it in my Bible and live in it for a while. And if it's a promise, that's my promise, I write it in my journal. And that leads me, first of all, I love to have daily devotional days. And I choose some of my da favorite daily devotional streams in the desert, daily light on the daily path, my utmost for his highest, sell your house for that one. Another one that I love is Voices from the Past. This is probably one of my very favorites, Puritan devotional readings, Voices from the Past. And I'll have a daily devotional day, and I'll read my daily devotions and look up all the scripture. Then another essential is to ask God for a promise every day. And you'll notice that in your handouts on the back, there is a section where you can write out 20 promises. Here's my challenge for you. For the next three weeks, ask God for a promise every day and write it on that page. You've got 20 spaces. And pray through those promises. Live in them. And that's another essential for me is praying through the promise, focusing on what God is saying. And then, not only praying through the promise, but applying that promise and memorizing the promise. That's another thing, is memorizing God's word. And I find that much of it is memorized just because I'm living in it. I'm writing it out. And when you write it out, there's something about the pencil hitting the paper, and the promise goes right through your arm, into your heart, and down into your feet, and you live it out. That's what happens. So those are some essentials that will help you to live in God's word, live in the promises so that you can look to Jesus, listen to Jesus, respond to Jesus, and believe Jesus, and pray to Jesus, and worship Jesus. Now, we don't have much time left, but I want to take about five minutes and you will notice, because I want to make sure that we don't just go out of here and just think about it but not do it. I want to make sure that we really understand about living in the promises. And I wrote two promises down there. And I'm going to bring out this little visual aid. It's going to take like two minutes. And you'll see that I have a promise written for you, two of them, but we might only just do the first one, okay? Okay. And I am going to ask you what you see in Isaiah 41.10 about your God. Because a promise is the I am's, the I will's of Scripture. What do you see about your God? And you can just shout it out. One thing, what, you, what do you see? Okay. I am strength. Now, if we were going to personalize that, what would you say? What is he to you because of what this verse says? He is my strength. So this is one of the things to understand that God does not give his word generally. He gives it to you personally. It's for you. He is my strength. Now, what else do you see in that scripture that he is for you? He is with me. He is with me. What else? Okay. He is our help. If you were sitting in your quiet time, what would you say? He is my help. He is my help. He promises. So when the Lord gives you a promise and you see it in the word, personalize it, write it in your journal, and then talk with God about it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are my strength. Thank you that you are with me, that you are my help. Thank you that you promised. George Mueller was a master at the promises of God and saw millions come in through his ministry because of how he was pleading the promises of God. And do you know what caused him to do that? He felt he was so weak in faith 
And yet we from afar see him as one of the great heroes of the faith. Do you know he read through the word of God 200 times in his lifetime? He knew the promises of God and he would plead them with the Lord and say, Lord, thank you that you are my strength. I'm going to take that all the way to the spiritual bank that you are my strength. And if you go on, there are other promises that say power is perfected in weakness. I love that. So that's just a quick sample of what God can do in his promises and through his promises. And as we close our time, I want to ask, how are you doing in the fourth watch of the night? Have you ever watched the movie Sea Biscuit? That amazing racehorse overcame all odds to become a champion. Do you know what the secret was with Sea Biscuit? He could run best in the fourth watch. He could run fast, but when the chips were down and the storm was raging, and things didn't look good. Do you know what happened? He won the race. The best scene in the movie is his first race after surviving an incredible leg injury that would have put any other horse down. And everyone said he would never run again. And halfway through the race, Sea Biscuit is in last place in that race. And then he's able to gain a bit of speed and come up to the next horse. And the jockey on the horse knew the power of Sea Biscuit. And he knew that once Seabiscuit realized the challenge of the race, that he was down, that the odds were against him, he knew he would win. He saw Seabiscuit look the other horse in the eye, and he knew it was over. He looked at Seabiscuit's jockey, and he said, have a nice ride. And Seabiscuit was off, past one horse, past the next, and finally every horse was left in the dust as he crossed the finish line to win the race. When everything is against you, and it looks like it's over, remember, it's not over. God has a plan, and he has an answer. You can stand strong. And just remember the race. Now it's our turn. Never forget the race, Hebrews 12, 1. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. As we close our time today, I encourage you to look to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Respond to Jesus. Believe Jesus. Pray to Jesus. And worship Jesus. And when you do, you will walk on water. And if there's someone in this room who may be new here, or maybe you've been searching, you've heard about faith, but you've never put your faith in Jesus, you need to know He died on the cross for your sins. And if you would like to know him personally, I invite you to pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I invite you now to come into my life, forgive my sin, and make me the person you want me to be. And then for everyone in this room, Lord, I lay that circumstance, whatever it is, that is tugging at the heart. I lay it at your feet, Lord. And I pray that you will give each woman in this room a promise to hold on to and enable them to get out of the boat and to walk on water with their faith. In Jesus' name, amen.